Joining us now to discuss energy security, General Wesley Clark, the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander. And we're grateful that you could spare some time for us at TVO tonight. Oh, thanks, Steve. Thanks so much. I want to share with uh, you numbers I'm sure you know and our viewers need to know. U.S. share of the world. Here we go. Michael Smith, if you would, let's bring these numbers up. This as of 2006. The U.S. has 4.6% of the world's population. It has 15 plus percent of energy production in the world and 21 plus percent of energy consumption in the world. So energy security, obviously a hugely important issue for U.S. Uh, interests. Security meaning, of course, both reliability of supply and price stability. And I want to start with security of supply. Paint us a picture, if you would, as we look back in time, of what have historically been the global energy routes that have maintained U.S. energy security. Well, in the first place, the United States was self-sufficient in energy until 1970, roughly. We were an oil exporting country. In fact, our supply kept Britain and the rest of the countries in World War II. So we never really gave it a thought. It's like agriculture is today. We have plenty, so we don't worry about it. And suddenly, it changed. Uh, it was a function of declining production uh, due to oil depletion and rising production costs and the emergence of a cartel which emphasized suddenly to the world that the United States wasn't king of oil anymore. And almost immediately, the Club of Rome published a report in 1972 warning that the United States was, and the world was going to run out of energy by the year 2000. Uh, there was panic. It was obviously a very simplistic economic model. I was teaching economics at the time at West Point, and we, we all picked it apart and found fault with it. But the message was an important message. It was that, that there are limits to natural resources. The OPEC nations quickly took advantage of that. And by the summer of 1973, we were in a full-fledged oil crisis. So that's where the real oil insecurity started. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of coal. We've got hundreds of years supply of coal. We may not like what it does to the atmosphere, but it's essentially about oil, and oil is essentially about transportation. So if you're looking at energy supply, you're really talking about the automobile, and Americans love automobiles like Canadians. Mm -hmm. But in terms of supply, you're talking, you're talking Middle East, you're talking us. Where else are you getting your oil well, from? Well, we're talking, there's a number, you're the number one, but right behind you is Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Venezuela, uh, Nigeria is a big um, supporter. United Arab Emirates gives us oil. Uh, other countries in Africa, Angola, for example, provides oil. Um, and then the other smaller sources around the world. But we're still a big producer. We're still producing five plus six million barrels a day. But a long way from self-sufficiency. Yes, and some of that's from Alaska and it's being sold to Japan because just of the economics of it. Got it. How great a role does the U.S., and I guess particularly its military play, in ensuring that safe, that safe rather, supply of energy, not only to the United States, but to other American allies as well? It's a, it's a key question, and, and the answer is not much directly, but hugely indirectly. And uh, starting really with the paper I wrote, I was a captain teaching social, teaching social science and economics at West Point. I went down to the Pentagon, I wrote the first of the papers on the energy crisis in 73. We were still involved in Vietnam, we just signed the agreement to get our POWs back, and. Here I was telling the Army that someday, because the Brits were no longer in the Persian Gulf, even though we had the Shah of Iran and the Saudis, that we might someday have to put U.S. troops over there. And uh, the Pentagon didn't want to hear it. Congress certainly didn't want to hear it. It took me uh, four years to get an article cleared for publication on this, and about that time the Shah was overthrown. We created the U.S. Central Command, and you know the rest is history. Mm -hmm. We fought for oil, first in the Gulf War. It was about oil. Uh, and U.S. leaders were candid enough to say so. They got lambasted for it because most people recognize oil is a pretty dumb thing to fight for. If you say it like that, you can buy it. So it has no value if it's not on the market. So you should buy it, not fight for it. Other but room? it's conditioned, and the United States Armed Forces, along with other armed forces, put a premium on maintaining access and all that goes with it. If you're going to go to the Middle East, then you've got to have bases to refuel at along the way. So you need a big air base in Spain, for example. You need Germany, you need NATO, you come the other way. It's a big infrastructure, How it drives it? the mission. How secure is that infrastructure today? It's good. Yeah, That's keeping good. those routes safe and yeah. secure? Yeah. I, you know, we could have handled the pirates if the pirates were really a serious issue that, you know, we've got forces in Djibouti, we can handle pirates. Well, you did recently, that's for sure. 
Uh, let's talk about resource nationalism. Some states are taking control of their oil and gas industries to guarantee supply. Other countries like China are buying overseas oil and gas assets, again, to ensure the supply. Tell us about, in your view, how these developments are changing the rules of the global energy game. Well, this really started back in the 70s when countries recognized they could nationalize and get away with it. Gaddafi was one of the first, and, uh, and he took over the oil resources. Other nations then cut their own deals. Uh, Ramco changed its terms. It's now a Saudi company with a few American and other outside experts. But country after country said, you know, this is our national, our national legacy. When North Sea oil came in, the Norwegians were quick to, to make sure they protected it. The, the Brits also. So it's always a mixed public-private process in which governments extract for their pension funds or other means something for the good of the people, rather than simply letting an oil company come in and drill and take it all out for a small leasing fee, which was the rule before. It's a, it's a give and take. If the country's too greedy, if it asks too much, if it shuts it down, uh, as Venezuela has done a couple of times, then what happens is the company says, okay, hey, you're on your own. We're not going to invest. Good luck. And of course, these nations don't have this very sophisticated and expensive technology. The proprietary knowledge in these oil exploration and production companies, just like in natural gas, is, is very significant. Yeah, but Chavez seems they, to be making his deals all over the world and getting away with it, doesn't he? He's, he's, he's playing it fast and loose, and the oil companies are bouncing back and forth. The rumor is China's given him some U.S. treasuries to use as collateral mm -hmm. so he can buy in the technology that he needs. But nobody has the technology that the United States oil companies have especially in, in dealing with this, uh, the tar sands in Venezuela, or tar uh, heavy oil in Venezuela, because they've been there. They know it. They've extensively explored and developed it. And like so much in the oil business, it's the particulars, the eaches, that save you millions of dollars of rediscovering what other people know. You think the U.S. and Canada should follow China's lead and secure domestic and overseas energy assets the way China has? Well, we have our domestic and overseas assets. Um, we have big U.S. companies in Angola, for example. Now they're selling it to the world market. But that's all to our advantage, the trades in dollars. The stability of that market all helps the United States. And, and we want that stability. So tell me, do you think the free market is sufficient, in your view, to ensure America's energy security? Well, there is no free market. There's always a regulated market. And the question is, how good is the regulation? And I think. Our newly appointed um, man who's in charge of the Commodities Futures Trade Corporation is looking at this. And I think we will find <clears throat> maybe not a complete exclusion of financial investors, but largely these markets, both oil, um, agriculture, wheat, corn, so forth, soy, these futures markets are there to smooth out volatility in price. They're there to provide hedging for people who can actually accept the delivery. Don't go into the potatoes market for futures unless you can accept a boxcar full of potatoes. The Economist magazine earlier this year published this, and I want to read this excerpt to you, and then we'll talk a bit about it. Tragedy and farce, The Economist writes, have too often been the hallmarks of European efforts to improve energy security. Dependence on Russia, which supplied a third of its gas imports through Kremlin-controlled east-west pipelines, seem to be rising inexorably and worryingly. Squabbling between Russia and Ukraine led to repeated supply cuts, the Russians exploited energy to divide and rule their Western neighbors. Do you think Europe is overly reliant on Russian supplies? Absolutely. They are. Well, in the sense that the Russian supplies are not the product of a free market. They're the product of, of, of heavy government control, and they're subject to being used in politically coercive ways. You have no doubt seen this map, which we'll put up now, the proposed Nabucco gas pipeline which is aimed at bypassing Russia, and there are other projects out there that are trying to do the same thing. If you do that, though, you're going to be, as this map suggests, avoiding Russia but going through some other countries which are, shall we say, perhaps not as democratic as yours or mine is. Uh, is this a better alternative? What if I were to tell you that there's plenty of natural gas in Eastern and Western Europe, or there appears to be, but that we just haven't known how to extract it? I would say, why haven't you started extracting it? I would say that the technology is just developing. You know, in the, uh, in the Canadian newspaper today, there's an article about how Alberta is in danger of losing its natural gas uh, exports, $7 billion a year worth to the United States. The price of natural gas has fallen uh, very, very quickly. 
we've quadrupled U.S. gas reserves through the discovery of a process of cracking open shale rock and taking the natural gas out of it. That's a difficult technology process. It's very proprietary, but people know how to do it. And they're going to do this in Europe now? Well, I don't know, but don't know. what if they did? It, it, you think it'd be a better alternative to dealing with well, all those Well, I think those it, it's an alternative, and I think that when you're dealing with um, a state like Russia that's historically insecure, that seeks to control its neighbors, that will use whatever means it has at hand to do so, that you need some alternatives. And that's a good one as far as you're concerned? It seems to be. Here's from the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper. While U.S. environmental lobbies were protesting against Prime Minister Stephen Harper's mission to Washington last week, accusing him of, quote, dirty oil salesmanship, the U.S. President's new special envoy on energy, David Goldwyn, was in Ottawa, telling officials that Canada is a, quote, pillar of U.S. energy security. It will be up to Canada, he said, to figure out how it can expand the high emissions oil sands without exceeding targets in greenhouse gas reductions. Even if Canada doesn't figure out how to exploit the oil sands without exceeding the CO2 reduction targets, can the U.S. afford to say no to Canadian energy supplies? Well, in principle, no. Right. But in practice, it all is balanced. Most of the energy supplies we're using, um, that we're interested in right now, and we're talking about shortages of, are for transportation. So for the United States and for Canada, it makes sense to use uh, to have as many alternatives as possible. You know, Canada is not a pure exporting, energy exporting country. I mean, it's importing refined products and mm -hmm. crude. And it, it would be possible, I guess, theoretically, for Canada to become self-sufficient. Um, all you need is the pipelines, refining capacity, and pay the price. <laughs> but oil from, from sand is very expensive. So get it to $200 a barrel, and there'll be no shortage of it produce it at $50 a barrel, and it's not quite economic right now. And so that's not paying the full social cost in terms of carbon sequestration and carbon emissions reduction in the production process. So all that has to be factored in. But look, we've got biofuels. Why don't we use biofuels? We're going to get to there. One more question on this. We've got electricity. We've got wind. We could do so Renewables. much more. Hold off, General. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. One more question on this. Again from The Economist, Cambridge Energy Research Associates, a consultancy, says Canada's share of the American oil market could grow to 37% by the year 2035 from 19% last year. You and I were talking before we went on the air that not necessarily every American regards Canada as an independent country. There are many who just sort of see it as an extension of, of the U.S. Now, we're not exactly Saudi Arabia, but we are a foreign country up here, and I wonder how big a concern is that to the people who are tasked with ensuring America's energy security. It's not a concern. Not a concern at all? No. Because there have no. been some great movies made about no, no, Canada no, no, flexing no, no, its no, no. independence we, 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 on we, energy we like, issues. We like Canada. We think there's so many common interests between the two countries and so many strong mm -hmm. relationships that, that we're not likely to get seriously out of sync on something as fundamental as that. Period. Full stop. Yes. Let's move beyond fossil fuels then. And before we get to renewables, I want to talk about nukes. This is from... Uh, Tom Friedman, columnist, New York Times. France today generates nearly 80% of its electricity from nuclear power plants, and it has managed to deal with all the radioactive waste issues without any problems or panics. And us, meaning you, we get about 20% and have not been able or willing to build one new nuclear plant since the Three Mile Island accident in 1979, even though that accident led to no deaths or injuries to plant workers or neighbors. In short, the French stayed the course on clean nuclear power, power despite Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, and we, meaning the Americans, ran for cover. Do you think nuclear is part of the solution in the States? Uh, I, it could be. We have new nuclear technologies. They're actually not so new, but we haven't adopted any, so even old mm -hmm. stuff looks new. But I'm talking about fast breeder reactors that have integrated waste um, recycling in them, so the nuclear waste is taken out. Uranium becomes plutonium. Plutonium is fed back into the reactor, mm -hmm. and the other products are... Uh, they, they're not long-lived fissile products. It's not waste, really. It's recycled. It's reused. recycling, and the products that are left are smaller in volume and less, um, less permanently toxic. And so maybe there's a future for this technology. It's there. There's a lot of people pushing it. The problem with nuclear is, A, it's very expensive. B, it's very slow. Now, if you didn't care about the environment, you weren't worried about building permits and so forth, 
then uh, and if you had the infrastructure base maybe you could put these things up like popping popcorn but I don't think that's a serious possibility so I think there's a place for it I'd like to see us continue to develop the nuclear technology but I don't think it's the main solution nuclear of course can also mean nuclear weapons proliferation and I wonder as a former military man whether that angle to the story keeps you up at night sure but not for the United States of America I mean I'm very worried about Iran right now and other countries that may be moving into the nuclear area look Japan has plenty of nuclear reactors and they have plenty of nuclear technology and they've deliberately said they're not going to become a nuclear power mm -hmm. and that's the kind of support that we need all around the world to keep us safe in this and we don't have it so uh, so nukes a piece of it but it's uh, for us here it's a smaller piece this from fortune magazine triumphant just a few years ago the ethanol industry now finds itself embattled environmentalists are turning their backs on it and it's even catching flack for higher food prices reporting for duty in ethanol's counterattack Wesley Clark, the retired four-star general and former NATO commander who signed on in February as co-chairman of an upstart ethanol trade group called Growth Energy. Well, you know this, of course, now that you're a part of this, that not just environmentalists are not totally keen on ethanol. They think the subsidies have distorted the energy market and so on. So tell us, is ethanol really part of the solution? Absolutely. Here? It is. Absolutely. Look, you've got 250 million cars in the United States. You've got another 25 million in Canada. The, these cars don't turn over every couple of years. These cars, some are more on the market 8, 10, 20 years even. And, and we keep building them better and better and better. So unless you're going to do a wholesale flush of all your transportation technology, you can't get to battery. You can't even get to hybrid very quickly. In fact, the latest studies show that with all of the efforts, all of the incentives, the United States may be 10% electric by 2030. So if you really are concerned about greenhouse gas emissions and really concerned about America's energy security, you've got to focus on that transportation sector. and You have to look for a system solution. Uh, improved mileage standards is a big part of that. Uh, you get that through smaller engines, lighter cars, and other things. But the most, uh, the greenest car you can get, the most fuel-efficient car, is probably an E85 hybrid. And ethanol is a big piece of that. The ethanol, like the other biofuels, inherently, it's totally carbon neutral. You know, if you use corn, for example, as the feedstock, and you, and you burn the ethanol, the, the CO2 that goes in the atmosphere is the CO2 that the corn took from the atmosphere. Now, where you pick up the carbon intensity is you have to plant and fertilize and grow the corn and harvest it, and you have to produce the ethanol. But these people work in ethanol, they're real smart. And all this bad news about and all this, these insinuations of how bad the ethanol industry is, that's mostly a lot of old, old data. The well, modern ethanol industry is very high technology. It's moving very quickly. The energy per gallon of ethanol is about one and a half times the amount of energy it takes to create it right now. And a lot of that energy is consumed in drying the distiller's grain that's fed back into the livestock industry. So those ethanol plants that don't have to dry it, they're even more energy efficient. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, modern ethanol plants probably produce about 40 percent life cycle of the per gallon uh, greenhouse gas emissions that a gallon of gasoline would. So it's 1.5 times, 1.4 times uh, energy intensity. It's about the same as gasoline, 40 percent, uh, 60 percent greener than gasoline. As you move towards cellulosic, you get greener and greener and greener until you finally get to the point where there's virtually no carbon footprint, okay. no net carbon footprint. But many people watching this will remember that you ran for president once upon a time, but, but you're not running for president anymore, I think. So well, I'm not running for president. So you don't have to suck up to the voters in Iowa anymore. So I didn't even campaign in Iowa. You may remember it was a great strategic error of my campaign. <laughs> I, I might have won had I campaigned there, but I didn't. And I got in too late. And But you're, 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 you're but so bullish on what Iowa I'm produces right now. I'm bullish on what the American you don't need to be, agricultural it? community can produce. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at corn, for example, it's just a remarkable record of accomplishment. We really haven't increased the acreage under production in corn, but we've increased the productivity per acre from something like maybe 30 or 40 years ago, 100 acre bushels an acre, up to 150 bushels an acre. The seed experts who are working the genetic modification of the corn, 
they're telling us 300 bushels an acre on average. Some folks in Iowa are already getting 300 bushels, but on average across the entire United States, we're looking at maybe 300 bushels an acre. We're looking at be able, being able to grow corn that takes nitrogen from the air and fixes it into the plant rather than having to fertilize it with nitrogen. All that can be done. and. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Well, here's a chart, and you can tell us about how to get from here to somewhere else. Uh, last year's figures, U.S. energy consumption, petroleum, it's still gas overwhelming, 37 uh, percent, natural gas at 24 percent, go up to the top, nuclear at 9 percent, coal, which everybody wants to get out of, I guess, at 23 percent, and there's renewable energy only at 7 percent of the U.S. energy consumption right now. What do you think needs to happen? in order for other alternatives like wind, like solar, like what you've just described, to be a bigger part of this chart? Steve, I think you have to segment the analysis. You've got to look at stationary power, and then you have to look at transportation energy. In the transportation side, there's really no alternative if you want to move beyond gasoline to going to biofuels in the near term. You may get some hybrid, you may get plug-in hybrids, eventually you may get some electric cars, but you can't turn over the, the transportation inventory fast enough to make a significant difference if you want to reduce some of that 11, 12 million barrels a day of imported oil to the United States. Forget about the 2 million coming from Canada. Mm -hmm. Let's just say we want to reduce it 8 to 10 million barrels a day. That's about, about biofuels in the near term. Um, and then if you're looking at stationary power, um, we need to change the way we have incentivized the wind and solar energies in the United States. They're basically incentivized through tax credits, not through power rates. In mm -hmm. Germany, there are feed-in tariffs, they call them, that, that give the wind and solar producers artificially high prices. This lets people compete on the basis of, of cost and, and price. In the United States, what we're doing is we're giving the opportunity for large investment firms and insurance companies to get passive income tax credits that aren't available to ordinary Americans because they don't have enough passive income to invest in wind and solar. And we've driven up the scale of the projects because these are Wall Street firms with Wall Street lawyers with Wall Street price tags. So bigger is better. So if you can do 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts would be a higher proportion of profit for us, and 200 would be better than 100. But the problem is it conflicts with the grid structure. Mm -hmm. The U.S. grid structure is very fragmented, and so it's not so hard to take a couple of megawatts of wind fluctuating as the wind blows, but put a couple of hundred megawatts on that grid and it completely discombobulates the grid. And so people are worried about this and a lot of the easy locations have already been taken up. In some states there's a 20 year waiting period for grid connections for these big projects. And so we're kind of choking on our own financing system. So change the financing system and change the scale of the effort as a near term. Distribute the energy move it, it's a great thing to say, hey, you can, you know, North Dakota is the Saudi Arabia of wind. Why, you could put up 10,000 turbines in North Dakota and just ship that energy out to both coasts. You could. But it's not as easy as it sounds because the grid is owned by people. And if you bypass it, they get upset, and that's politics. So why not take the technology and the financing and distribute the generation? Do it closer to the cities with wind and solar. And um, if that, that would be possible if you would let Americans have ordinary income tax credits rather than passive income tax credits. You'd get John Q. Public anxious, eager to invest in something that gives an 8 or 10 percent rate of return, which is what these projects give. Okay, let me just follow up on this. You won't mind my asking, but you're, you're, you're bullish on ethanol. I assume you've got a piece of some ethanol companies along the way or something? Well, I wanted to start an ethanol production facility. That's how I got into it in Arkansas with, with rice straw and rice hulls. Mm -hmm. and, and I went to the ethanol producers and that really knew something about it. They said, be careful. This is not like an erector set. I mean, <laughs> you can buy the plant, but it's not just about having the right technology in the plant. You have to operate it. It's trial and error. It's like a chemistry set. It's like brewing beer, except it's a couple of times more complicated than just brewing the beer because there's a few other steps. It's all about efficiency, and uh, they said it takes years to sort of tinker with this and get it so right. So you put your own money into this? So uh, I haven't yet. So what I want to do is learn it. So I went with the corn-based ethanol producers, and that's how I got involved in growth energy. Now, I'm also in wind. I'm in solar. I'm in um, biodiesel. 
and um, and I'm in wind production as well as wind developments. Covering so all the bases. I, you, you, and I'm in oil. I'm in gas. You you can't really talk knowledgeably about this unless you're on the inside of the business. It's not just about smart staffers on the Hill who listen to what lobbyists say. I mean, I, I wanted to get deep into the stuff of this. I talked about it in my presidential campaign. I've written about it for 35 years and worried about it since I was a captain teaching economics at West Point. And, and so this was my chance out of politics to really dig into it. So I'm on all these boards and working these technologies and developing money. I'm an investment banker on Wall Street, so I know the financial side of this thing. And it's very, very exciting. Hmm. But there are some obstacles. And you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that big groceries, big food, likes cheap corn, so mm -hmm. they wouldn't like ethanol that comes from corn. And big oil, they may buy some ethanol refineries and they may profit from mixing and getting the, the blender subsidy, but basically their price is made at the margin. And so when you're selling 10 or 15% of the gasoline market off to ethanol, they start to worry. It changes the value of their refinery. It changes their future plans. And so big oil worries about this. And in the wind business, of course, utilities worry about it because their job is to keep rates low and be reliable. And, and, and wind comes in and knocks at the door and says, hey, I'm just a little guy and would you talk to me? And we've got our lawyers and our lawyers are too busy to talk to all of you developers. And, you know, there's all these frictions and so forth. And it's about change and change leadership by the United States government. Our that's president came in and said he, he was for change. That's what I was going to ask you. That was so, you know, he's, he's said all the right words, but the incentives don't quite yet support it. The White House recognizes the problem. They know they've got to move it. There's a lot of items on the agenda. And there are strong elements who are resistant to change. So Just our, as they are in healthcare. In, uh, absolutely. So, in, in our last thirty seconds, do you think the do you think the American people have a clear understanding of what the Obama administration wants to do on energy security? I don't think security? they have a clear understanding of the threat that faces us if we don't take action on global warming and climate change. Some people joke about how Canada is going to benefit because you got the northern route and you're going to be growing pears on Baffin Island. But the honest truth is, it's going to make a mess for all of our countries. It's a global national security issue with the displacement of billions of people, crops changing, migrations, disease, economic dislocations, and we need to do what we can to reduce the rate of climate change. It's too late to stop it. But a six to 10 foot sea level rise in this century will be disaster for a billion people. Mm. And so we should be taking action. I don't think our publics in Canada and the United States fully recognize it. They think it's still something to debate. I think the science, scientific evidence is incontrovertible at this point. General Clark, it's uh, awfully good of you to spend so much time with us here at TVO tonight. Thank Thanks so much. Thank you.